right, we'll get going. Uh, we'll respect everybody's everybody's time. So thanks for um, <laughs> for getting on. This is really a session. We went right at about an hour last night, and we just want to make sure that we are answering any questions anybody has with regards to um, the season, umpiring, assigning, training, and the like. So, uh, so John and I are here. We are resources for you, not just during this call, but after the call and throughout the season. So please use us. Um, our information is available online. Kat, I will have to get your email from John and invite you to Arbiter. So you'll get all the emails there. But um, my info is on the emails that went out about this call. So please, please give a ring. And if I don't pick up, just leave a voicemail or text me. It's my cell. But um, I don't have her info at all. So I don't have her info. Okay. <clears throat> Kat, if you could... Um, Okay, there's that. If you could give me your your email, I, I need that more than a cell. Okay, I, I think I put both in the um, okay. the chat. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. Perfect. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. So um so what we're gonna do is we're gonna we're gonna show a couple of videos. We're gonna answer some questions. Um, talk a little about ratings day. Um, and maybe just get you guys sort of a little bit more excited about the season, which we hopefully will finally get there. Um, so with that, John, uh, you want to in introduce yourself or are you past that point? Is John muted again? Yeah. You know, these, this technology for us old guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not dead yet. So I'm not past introducing myself. Um, I, I work with U.S. Lacrosse. I'm sort of the contact for officials development in Kentucky. So I'm not really, uh, I'm, I'm a member of club and, and work games and I'm an assigner for Commonwealth League, but I'm not really uh, part of club leadership. Okay. And John and I, we, we, when we talk, we'll, we'll mention Commonwealth League and we'll mention Kissel, which is the Kentucky Scholastic Lacrosse League, which is the greater Louisville area. Um, and there's usually also a middle school league for Louisville through the schools or through the, the JCPS. But this year there will not be, although there will be a Sunday middle school league that Hallie Bray will be assigning that will be at King Louis. Um, so that's sort of where we, we are there. So you'll hear us mention club, which is the Kentucky Lacrosse Umpires Board. You'll hear us mention the Commonwealth League, which is essentially all the teams outside of the greater Louisville area, and then Kissel, which is the greater Louisville area teams. Um, so just to sort of answer any questions there. But if you have any other questions anytime throughout this call, just um, just chime in or send a chat and we'll we'll work on it. So John's showing us the path to certification and he's sort of fighting something. So I'll talk. Um, so first of all, we have to join us the cross. There's a, a number of different reasons for doing that. Um, one of those is insurance. So by being a member, you are protected from liabilities and some other things. And us as assigners, um, we are also protected. Uh, it allows us to view U.S. Lacrosse online training videos, which they've done a really nice job this year. Uh, there's new umpires orientation, which is today and yesterday. And then we've got an old umpires clinic, which hopefully will last about an hour and a half on Saturday. And then we're supposed to have ratings day, but I just got a call from uh, the commissioner for boys lacrosse. And he said that JCPS might have, might be throwing a wrench into those plans. So sort of stay tuned for that. But right now we're scheduled to have a rating day on February 28th. And that's important because everybody needs to have a rating. Um, one of the things that's different about the, the women's or girls game versus the boys game and other sports. So we have to have a rating. So you get out there for ratings day, you'll officiate a half. You'll be on the sidelines for a half. You'll ask questions, you'll get out there for another half, and you'll get a rating based on how you do on the field. Uh, we don't expect you to be great. 
we're there to help you become a better official, answer questions you have, and to get you more acclimated with blowing your whistle, pointing, uh, maybe showing the signal for the foul, things like that. Um, and if we don't do it on the 28th, we will come up with a, a plan C at that point. And then you have to take the test. Um, and that's all available online. And John will show us later how to go into your portal and see what training is required and then see what test you have to take. There are essentially three tests. One is a high school test, one's a youth test, and then there's a combined high school and youth test. And that's the one that we have to take. So as, as mentioned earlier, uh, we all have to be members of U.S. Lacrosse. Uh, you get insurance through that and some other things. So that is really the key thing. But then there's also training. There's information that's available. There's a wonderful manual that's hundreds of pages that you can download and print if you'd like, or just download and have on your computer. And the manual is a super resource to, um, to learning more about what is actually not a foul possibly. So we all know that you can't cover, but there are instances where covering the ball is not a foul. And so the manual will go in and will explain to you why it is that there are certain instances where a cover is not a foul. Uh, and you'll see coaches scream about, oh, she covered. Well, there are times when it's not a foul. So the manual will take what we have in the rule book. It will take that little two sentences about what a cover is, but then it'll expound on it and say, well, but there's a couple instances when a cover is not a cover. And these are those instances. Um, and it explains about um, positioning and moving from trail to the, the official behind to the official in front and things like that. So be a member of US Cross, you have to be a member. Um, it's, and as a first year official though, it's free to you. So, so trying to help people get involved in the sport uh, I believe it's, was it John, $55 for officials? Yes. And I'm sorry, Chris, I'm picking something up on the <laughs> chat. <laughs> um, U.S. Lacrosse has changed its testing system. So when you go in to take the test, there are three tests available. A youth only, which is 50 questions. A high school only, which is 50 questions. And a combined, which is 50 questions. A club is requiring us to take the combined high school and youth test of 50 questions. Thanks, Chris. That was popping yeah, up. Yeah, and, no, that's good. And I, I just wanted to clarify on the fee. So U.S. lacrosse fee is, is paid by everybody. Everybody has to pay that. But the club fee uh, would normally 50 $35, I think, for a new year, uh, first year official, but but now it's free. So if you're a first year official, you don't have to pay that fee. It's free to you. So uh, club is trying to do what they can to minimize the cost, but you still have to be a member of U.S. Lacrosse. All right, John, thanks. John, do you think now might be a good time to show how you get to that through your portal? Yeah, again, apologies for uh, uh, my coughing. <coughs> okay, I've got to get out of that and on. Okay, now this is the way I do it. There may be an easier way. Uh, I go to U.S. Lacrosse. There we go. <laughs> I log in, I go, I, when I log in, I usually just go to my account. Now you have to be a U.S. lacrosse member at this point. So log in. There's the hamburger, <coughs> hamburger up on the left-hand corner. 
uh, e-learning. Okay, now I'm, I know this is all seems convoluted, but it's, it's the way it's worked for me. This is John, the we're not, John, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, shoot. Oh, I know what I did. Well, it's a communist plot is what it is. How about now? There you go. You want me to back out, start all over? Maybe I better. Sorry. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes. Okay, go to US Lacrosse, log in. You have to be a US Lacrosse <coughs> member at this point. Go to the hamburger. E-learning. Okay, now, my apologies, here we are. This is the main <laughs> e-learning page. It says Girls Lacrosse Officials right here. Click on that. Now, for some reason, this doesn't take me to everything, but see this hashtag over here on the upper right-hand corner, 2021. <laughs> 2021 ODP learning, click on that. We are officials, click on that. Okay, for first year and second year, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay, first and second year, you're taking, okay, so here we go. Here are the three rules exams. You only take the one combined U.S. lacrosse and uh, NFHS rules exam. There's a rules online course that needs to be taken. Uh, there's a, uh, let's see, there's an annual <laughs> rules interpretation. Those two need to be, when I say taken, viewed. And then I'm scrolling down to level one, <coughs> new officials. You need to view those uh, LaxCon webinars. Now that was a decision that uh, uh, club leadership made. So everybody kind of got that. I think the, the pathway to that went out in, a, in an email <laughs> and assuming I'm not in the hospital or something, if you send me an email, I can get you that. Or Chris, I don't know, do you, are you, have you followed it through e-learning? Chris? Um, followed what? It followed the way to get to everything we need to do. Yeah, I, I we sent out an email. I don't yeah. know who all got the email, but it, it sort of explains it there and you followed it right now okay uh, I think I <laughs> I have these links and so on on my unofficial web blog sliderlax.com <clears throat> there's a welcoming post and then the post below that just scroll down and you'll see <laughs> how to get to all this stuff I'll try to be available to uh, to answer questions and get you there okay <laughs> All right, so if anybody has any questions um, on... I, I, I got a question. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, um, on the combined test um, with the... Um, is it... It's When they mean combined test on the 50 questions, is it going to be randomized with, like, the youth and the high school stuff? Yes. Okay, I, that was all I had. As a matter of fact, they will give you the rule with the question so yeah so you can print out the test and as john just mentioned it gives you the rule that they're asking about underneath the question so you can go to the rule book 
you can look it up and then you can take the, the test uh, or answer the question and then go, you know, you print it out, take the, take the test on the printed version and then go in and put the answers online. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Let's see. All right. So yeah. as, go ahead, John. Sorry. Oh, are you getting my screen here? Yes. Okay. Um, so everybody will go in, take the test. Uh, you can take a question as many times as you want. Um, it's open book. And the rule book is the 2020 rule book. Uh, because there were no changes for this year. So if you see a 2020 rule book and you think, oh, I need to get the 2021 rule book, you don't. Yeah, we're using the 2020 rule book, which is, hold it, here. So 2020 is brown. And it can be downloaded uh, through the NFHS website. I, it's like five or six dollars to get the e version. POE. POE points of emphasis. Um, and again, we, we want to be consistent. And what they're saying here, officials need to be cognizant of not disadvantaging the ball carrier when, when unnecessarily restart resetting play. So what they're saying is, for instance, there's a foul at the midfield. Well, the rule book says that the self-start is supposed to be done within a playing distance, which is a stick length sticks and a half length of where so you're, you're talking about you know five four or five feet from where the foul occurred well if the foul occurs in the midfield and the girl's sprinting down the field and she gets fouled chances are by the time she stops sprinting she's gonna have gone five six seven eight feet past where she actually got fouled um so if she slows down recognize the foul the person who fouled her is behind her if she goes, we're, we're going to be okay with that because we don't want to have, you know, move her back. Well, the person who fouled her is already behind her. So then we got, you know, we got to move back two people. Uh, it's just going to be unnecessary. So we just want to be consistent. We don't want someone to gain an advantage through it. So for instance, if the foul occurs around the restraining line and she stops past the restraining line, then we'll want her to come back above the restraining line because by her going below it, she's gained an advantage because then the attack can't, can't redefend because she's below the restraining line. So just things like that. Um, they don't necessarily have to stop. It's like going, doing a rolling stop at a stop sign. So there's been a foul, we blow the whistle for the foul. The player sort of hesitates, sort of slows down. They've, they're recognizing that a foul has been incurred. They can self-start. So they don't have to be feet planted, you know, firmly in concrete, and then they can start. No, we just want them to recognize that a foul has been called, to slow down, and then they can self-start. Um, unlike two years ago when self-starts were first brought in, we gave them the benefit of the doubt when they – when they essentially false started, when they self started, when they weren't allowed to, um, we we let that go because it was a learning year for everybody. But right now, if there is a foul that requires the whistle to be blown to restart play, like an offsides, like offsetting penalties, any foul in the critical scoring area, at this point, they're going to want us to award a false start. So the ball will go to the other team. And let me see here. So Ruby, um, good question. If you could maybe get on and, and so Ruby's asking a question about the progression of false start penalty. Um, don't think that there's gonna be really a progression. Uh, we, we wanna be proactive. So for instance, an attacker charges in the eight. So we're giving the ball to the defense coming out. 
we want to be proactive as officials and say, it's a whistle start, it's a whistle stop, you know, just do whatever you can because you don't want to. So the defense just played really good defense and they're getting the ball. They, they, they forced a turnover. We don't want to have a cheap false start giving the ball back to the attack. So we want to be demonstrative. We want to come in, you know, stop, wait. It's a whistle, point your whistle, stop. Um, because that will draw their attention and, and you, you just don't want them to fall start because then the ball gets turned over and it's going the other way. So uh, there's really not a progression. Uh, if the whistle is blown for a foul, which requires us to have a whistle to restart play, like a foul in the critical scoring area, offsides, offsetting penalties, things like that, we, we want to be proactive and stop the player from false starting, but there isn't really a progression, but that's a good question. Um, consistent and proper officiating in this area. Okay, so yeah, so we, we just want to be consistent. We want to, you know, like I said, you, you want to be proactive, you want to be vocal, you want to use your hands, you know, you put up a stop sign to the player because usually, you know, she's going to pick up the ball and you're like, wait, stop. You know, you want to get her attention. And then you're like, it's a whistle. And like, oh, okay, so wait. And then, you know, a lot of times they go. And what, what can you do? You've done everything you can. Um, so just to let everybody know, if you have a false start by the defense coming out, the ball will get turned over to the attack on the 12. Uh, so they don't get a free position on the eight, the ball goes to the 12. Thanks, John. So what we're, we're talking about here, delay game, self-start. So a player fouls another player and she stands right in front of the player getting the ball. So because she's standing right in front of her, the chances of that player self-starting are slim because there's a defender right in front of her. So we want players after a foul has been called to get four away if it's a minor foul or four behind if it's a major foul. But you'll have some players in order to slow the team going down the field, they will stand right in front of them waiting or instead of like going four away to go behind, they will sort of stay right in front of them to prevent them from self-starting. We want to address that. You want to tell the you know, whistle, maybe call the captain over and say, look, that's a delay of game. The next time we're going to card it. So you've, you've worked with the captain, let the captain address it with her team. But that's the way uh, Ruby had a question about progression for um, false starts. This is a progression for a delay of game, preventing a team from self-starting. So team fouls. They are preventing, purposely preventing the team from self-starting by putting someone right in front of them. So we want to be proactive, but work through the captain, give them that, that opportunity to tell their teammates, hey, look, you know, we can't do that. And then deal with it with cards. Um, so we have those, those tools in our tool bag to address situations like this. It's a delay game. It's a green card. Any questions on that? Gotcha. All right. Uh, repetitive fouls. So a good example of a repetitive foul is um, a team playing with a horizontal stick. So a horizontal stick, if there's contact with the body, is a foul. They're supposed to have it at 10 and 2. So it really doesn't take much effort to take your hands going from here to like this. So a repetitive foul, horizontal stick, not really cross-checking, but horizontal stick to body is a foul. Uh, if they continue to do it after you've blown the whistle, then we can upgrade to a, you know, a, a major foul and we can card it after multiple uh, whistles. But again, you want to address it with the captain possibly or with the coach. Say, coach, they got to get their stick vertical. Okay, you've done what you can, then you can possibly go to a card, uh, which would be a yellow card for repetitive fouls. It would not be a green card. 
And by blowing your whistle, you're, you're telling everybody on the field that what they're doing is not correct and you want it addressed. So while you're calling the foul on one particular player, in essence, by blowing your whistle, you are sending a signal, a message to everybody that that action is not allowed. Thanks, John. Okay, so we are going to show an older clip on shooting space. There are some things in this clip that got changed, but it's a great video showing uh, for all the visual learners out there, showing everybody um, exactly what shooting space is. We will stop it and I will correct the verbiage when it's not correct, uh, because this was done about five years ago but the U.S. Cross did a really good job. So unlike other fouls, which we can use a flag to, um, if, if the foul occurs in the critical scoring area and they are on a scoring play, we can pull our flag to show that we recognize that a foul has occurred, but we're allowing the player to go to goal. With shooting space, there is no flag. It's an immediate whistle and it's our loudest whistle. You want the player to not shoot the ball. You don't want someone to get hit with a shot and then you have to deal with that situation. Um, but again, just because maybe you got your whistle up late and the player was in her shooting motion and she shoots safely, which can be done, uh, but you've blown your whistle. So even if she scores, the goal does not count. But just because she shoots doesn't mean she should be carded for dangerous propelling. Um, if she hits a player, then yes, you've got a foul, a mandatory card for danger propelling, which is this signal. But then you also have shooting space, probably. And so you've got offsetting fouls. Uh, just be aware that a lot of times there are offsetting fouls for when there is a danger propelling um, yellow card. Chances are the player was more than a six length away, which would mean they were in shooting space. But just be aware that if she shoots, she could shoot safely. Uh, and many times I will thank a player because it's tough for us to see everything with only two, two officials on the field. Uh, you know, and you can see maybe she bounces it past the defender who's in shooting space. And I'll say, hey, you know, thanks. Thanks for that. Or you see some players that are, you know, they're waiting for the whistle, they're in their shooting motion, and at the last second they hold up and they didn't shoot, even though the, they, they could have, but a player was in front of them and you thank them. It's like, hey, thanks for not shooting. You appreciate when players exhibit that higher level of, of you know, fast thought and the, the fact that they know that they could get carded and they need to shoot safely. As one of those, one of these, um, Block says, uh, you know, it's an immediate whistle, but the shooter has responsibility to shoot safely. Uh, I was told at one point many years ago, there was no shooting space foul because players were not jumping into that free space to goal. That was a long time ago, but I was told that that is correct. So, um, so we're going to send you, show you some clips. We're going to talk about them. If you have questions, ask questions. Free space to goal, commonly defined as shooting space, is perhaps the most difficult rule in women's lacrosse to understand and to officiate. The following lesson will help umpires, coaches, and players understand shooting space and what requirements need to be met before the call is made. When shooting space is present, it is an immediate whistle. This foul may not be flagged. Additionally, if a shot is taken and a goal is scored during a shooting space whistle, the goal does not count. It is impossible to know when the goalie relaxes in this situation. Therefore, the penalty stands and the correct penalty setup must be administered. When discussing shooting space, it is important to note that the defenders who are within a stick's length of any attacker, ball carrier, or otherwise are not in the shooting space. Umpires must be positioned to see the space between players to determine whether or not a defender is within a stick's length. Note that the definition of this is literally within the length of a single stick 
which does not include the player's arm length. Trail umpires must not be directly behind the ball carriers. They should be offset. What does this mean? To the left or right and not directly behind. This enables the umpire to have depth perception and see through the space. First, let's visualize the shooting space. It resembles an ice cream cone, with the ball carrier being the point on the cone and the goal circle being the ice cream. The edge of the shooting space is where the goal circle meets the goal line extended, not the edges of the cage. Notice the difference. Officials should be aware how shooting space changes as the ball carrier moves toward the goal, and also how shooting space changes as the ball carrier moves from the low hanging hashes to the middle. Players are allowed to have their sticks in the shooting space lane as long as their body remains safely out of the lane. In the two-person system, the lead official will be looking up at the shooting space lane on her side and the trail official will be offset looking down the lane for shooting space. When an 8 meter is awarded at the hanging hash and defenders are cleared along the lane, see how many steps it takes to be in the shooting space. John, can you pause that real quick? Sorry. All right, so this situation, um, again, this was, was put together by U.S. Lacrosse uh, a number of years ago. We're not going to have this situation now because we have the penalty zone. So those players that are low along the goal line extended, uh, 24 and the player to the left of her, they will not be there in our game these days because everybody has to be five meters below. So they'll be by the yellow line if they're going to be below the goal line extended. Um, but no one will be in that situation. So this was an issue before, but right now with the penalty zone, it's been cleared up considerably. So what they're saying here uh, will not be in our game today. Potential shooting space will happen to arrive in the shooting space lane. Again, this won't happen these days, but the top one, number 16 or six, 16, that will occur these days. But the two lower ones won't because they can't. The first criteria for a shooting space call is that the attacker must be looking to shoot. All right, John, can you pause this real quick? Here it is clear the ball carrier wants to get the ball to her teammate. So again, this, the verbiage looking to shoot um, was in the rule book years ago and it got taken out. So they don't necessarily need to be looking to shoot in order for shooting space to be called. Um, again, we, we have to recognize, you know, are they, are they passing or, or what, but, um, the first criteria, which they mentioned there is not in the rule book today. Behind the goal and she is not looking to shoot. Watch when she gets the ball a second time. She is clearly looking to shoot. This is something the umpire judges based on circumstances of the play and visual cues from the ball carrier. Watch how differently the player looks when she is looking to shoot. The next criteria needed to make a shooting space call is that the ball carrier must have the opportunity to shoot. This means the game situation presents the attacker a clear and safe way to shoot. Watch as the attacker in double and single coverage is being so tightly marked she has no opportunity to shoot. It is always the shooter's responsibility to shoot safely. She may not shoot through defenders if the defenders are within a stick's length of her or are within a stick's length of her teammates. The following scenes show familiar game situations where shooting space is not present. 
Defenders who stay with cutters within a stick's length who are being drawn through the shooting space by attackers are not in shooting space. Shooting space is not a one-to-one -one ratio like the three seconds call is. It is possible for multiple defenders to be guarding a non-ball attacker. When this happens, none of those defenders are in shooting space. However, some may be in three seconds. The attacker is the player ruining the shooting opportunity here, not the defenders. Watch this legal play, which shows a defender with a great understanding of the shooting space rule. Do not penalize the defender who makes a quick adjustment to get out of the shooting space lane. Remember, defenders may leave their sticks in the shooting space lane as they approach the ball carrier, and once they are within a stick's length, can then position themselves in front of the attacker. Here are some examples of shooting space violations. Watch a textbook shooting space call. Officials should be ready to make a shooting space call as soon as the ball enters the critical scoring area. Defenders who choose to mirror the attacker who is playing behind the goal are exempt from the three second count in the eight meter. However, they are still responsible to have ball awareness and to adjust to the play and stay out of the shooting space. Here is an example of a proper adjustment made by an aware defender in order to avoid being in shooting space. Remember defenders who are drawn through the shooting space who maintain a stick's length marking distance from an attacker are not in the shooting space. When defenders wish to leave their mark to go to the ball carrier, they must do so while staying out of the shooting space. This scenario must be timed appropriately because when it is not, it will result in a shooting space call. Here is a defender who incorrectly leaves her mark to play the ball carrier. The goalkeeper, while dressed in protective equipment, must also abide by the shooting space rules when she leaves her goal circle. Watch the goalie in the shooting space lane. This must be called. Zone defenses can lead to shooting space being present, since defenders will often be positioned just above the 8 meter, but not marking an attacker. Now let's use the ropes to teach officials how to properly administer clearing the penalty lanes. When major fouls occur in the critical scoring area outside the 8 meter arc and play is stopped as a result, the official must clear the penalty lane. When a foul is called in the Now let's use the ropes to teach officials how to properly administer clearing the penalty lanes. When major fouls occur in the critical scoring area outside the 8 meter arc and play is stopped as a result, the official must clear the penalty lane. When a foul is called in the critical scoring area, officials should be aware of where the players are at the end of the play so they can be moved appropriately. Here are the officials' roles in facilitating clearing the lane. When a major foul has occurred in the critical scoring area outside the 8 meter, the lane will be cleared and players should be cleared so as to maintain relative position to the ball and other players at the end of the play. All right. Uh, again, with free movement, uh, we do not really concern ourselves with having players going to any particular area. Um, as we did in the past. So right now, there's really only two players we're concerned with when a foul is called. The player who's getting the ball and the player who fouled uh, will go behind or away. So with free movement, they can go everywhere. But if you have a foul in the critical scoring area, uh, the player in between the 8 and the 12, the player is going to go to the 12. The player foul is going behind and we're clearing that lane. But in this video, they're talking about, you know, players have to clear together and you have to remember where they, they were at the time of the foul. Fortunately, that's not part of the game anymore. So we don't have to, like, take a snapshot and say, oh, you were here and you two are here and you have to go here. They can go anywhere. So, like, on an eight-meter free position, they can, have, they can be moving around the field. They just have to be outside the penalty zone. But the only two players you're really concerned about are the player taking the free position and the player fouled. All right, John, thanks. Since this play was called by the lead, 
and is closest to the lead, she will direct all players to stand and will set up the foul according to the seven-step whistle plan. Her partner should be engaged in making sure players don't move until they are instructed and that they go where they were told and maintain relative position. When the same scenario occurs on the far side, the trail will need to be more active in assisting the lead and making sure the lane is clear since only the trail will be able to visualize this. When fouls occur inside the 8 meter arc, the entire arc must be cleared. For major fouls, the arc in the lane needs to be cleared. Players are cleared with respect to relative position and then utilizing the shortest route out. The umpiring. Yeah, so again, we, we don't have the shortest route out. We don't have relative position. Again, we're just worried about two players. The player who's, who's going to be taking the free position and the player who fouled is going behind. Um, the adjacent hashes go to the defense. But if a defender doesn't step up to the hash, then an attacker can go to that hash. But as long as a defender wants that hash, um, they're entitled to it. Crew must work together to assure proper arc clearing. The official who stops the play will be responsible for setting up the foul. The other official will be taking a mental picture of the players at the end of the play and will assist in making sure relative position is maintained. Again, we don't have relative position. Attacking anymore. players may also attempt to move to a more advantageous position to receive a pass or block a defender. Do not allow this. Players will attempt to move to the most advantageous position or will move before they are instructed in order to be at a hash closest to the shooter. Do not allow this. So again, our game has gotten simplified because we're not worrying about people going to an advantageous position. We don't really care where they're going. As long as they're outside the penalty zone, it's, it's part of the game. And it, it, for us, it's gotten a lot simpler. Um, we're not worried about the jostling on the adjacent hash. It automatically goes to the defense. So you don't have to worry about, well, she was here first and whatever. If a defender wants the hash, they get the hash. Um, so just be aware of that. This Players often do not understand the rules by which umpires clear the arc. You can use language to help them, such as clear out like spokes on a wheel or rays of sunshine. They must understand that positioning is not awarded on a first come first serve basis. Insist they stand until they are directed to move to avoid players jockeying for hash marks. All right, John, I think, are we done with that? All right, good. Okay, anybody, any questions on shooting space? Um, the video, I think, does a good job with the ropes. It sort of explains it, makes it visual. As well, most of us are visual learners, especially with something like that. So um, yeah, it's just good to see that depending on where the ball carrier is, how close they are to the goal circle, how far away they are, that the, the pie gets really wide or it gets really narrow. Uh, so just sort of be aware of that. Um, the trail official is responsible for shooting space on their side of the field. The lead official is responsible on their side. Oh, uh, yeah. Brian, I have... talk about arbiter pay now. I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. Yeah, yeah um, on the free movement part of it, um, that, that is it been slightly changed a little bit uh, this year compared to the past um, when you were talking about uh, free movement um, with um, with the respect to the players um, they can move anytime outside of that 12 meter mark but if they're inside we have to like tell each player to move in a certain spot no nope. is that still true or no nope, nope, they, they if there's free movement they can go wherever they want as long as they're outside the penalty zone. And we have to make sure that if it's an eight meter free position, the adjacent hashes, the, so the hash is next to where the ball carrier is, uh, the attacker is getting the ball, goes to the defense. Everybody else, they can be moving around, they can be anywhere they want. Okay, uh, oh, okay, yeah, okay, uh, thank you. Yep. I guess I'm up uh, on this. 
All right, good, thanks. <clears throat> I have a little tutorial on Arbiter and Arbiter Pay. We, if we get too involved to, to present it now, um, it's a PowerPoint, sliderlax.com. In the right-hand column, you'll see my categories. Click on Arbiter <laughs> and you'll get that, um, that um, PowerPoint tutorial. <laughs> a lot of new officials forget to check ready to assign on their main page. Uh, if you don't <laughs> check that, then you're not assignable. So make sure you check that. That's really all I had. All right, anybody have any questions on Arbiter? So Arbiter is the main avenue through which you will get assigned games. And it really is nice because it will allow you, for instance, if you are a student and you have a late class on a particular day, every day that week, you can go into Arbiter and you can block, which means uh, it will not let John or I sort of essentially see you because you're not available for us to assign on a particular time. So say you get done with class at 6 p.m., <laughs> You would go in and you would block until 6 p.m. And it would make it available for us to see you probably from like 7 o'clock on. Uh, so it would, it would figure in that you could then travel to the game. Um, be aware that the address, <coughs> we sometimes use the address that's in Arbiter to determine sometimes where we, we, we put you. Because we don't want to send you all over town if there are games near your home. But be aware that if you have the address, <coughs> your home address, but you're coming from work and say you work near Mail High School, Mail is also close to Collegiate and Manual Stadium is not too far away. Um, so just be aware that we won't necessarily know where your work address is. So let us know, just, just drop us a line but you need to go into Arbiter and start putting in blocks because John and I are gonna start assigning games in the next week or so. Okay, as I mentioned, rating day. Right now it's scheduled for February 28th, which is Sunday from 12 to about six. It might change, um, but the goal of rating day is for you to become a little bit more comfortable with being on the field, with blowing your whistle for recognizing fouls. Because sometimes people recognize the foul and they're like, oh, I forgot to blow my whistle. And play is continuing. We're just going to let play go on. So we want you to be, be more comfortable with blowing your whistle, uh, with signals, get, get, get in front of a mirror and practice. Okay, you know, illegal procedure you know, shooting space, uh, different things like that. So get in front of a mirror and see how you look. And because a lot of times, you know, people have their hands real low, but we want your hands generally to be higher so that people all around you can, can see them better. Um, but as John here, first and last impression, the uniform is an important thing. We wear black and white stripes. The stripes are one inch and you can wear a black kilt, black pants, black shorts. We understand that sometimes black pants might have white stripes. Uh, if you can get all black, that's great. We understand that sometimes that's not possible. Uh, we want black accessories. If you can get an all black shoe, that's great. Uh, but we understand that sometimes that's hard to come by. Um, and they might have like a white insole or something like that. Uh, get a good pair of shoes. You're going to be running. You want to be comfortable. You don't want something to happen to your feet. Um, black outerwear. Uh, I came back from my game and I had, you know, black in addition to my stripes. Um, so black Under Armour or whatever brand you can wear. Uh, if you are torn between, say, funds are an issue and you can only buy one shirt, I would recommend getting a short sleeve shirt. And you can wear a black Under Armour underneath, that's, that's fine. Uh, at some point, you'll want to get a long sleeve shirt. But if you can only get one shirt, get the short sleeve shirt. And but get it, make sure it's large enough, though, that you can wear Under Armour underneath. 
And then you wanna make sure that you have cards, which are your red, green, yellow cards, your whistle, a flag, and you wanna make sure that you get, have like a pencil to be able to write stuff with, and a coin. It can be any coin, bigger the better, usually because um, just tough if it's a real small coin. And actually this year, we might not have a coin toss uh, because of COVID restrictions, which we will let everybody know later. We're looking at maybe going with um, the visiting team having alternate possession with the home team choosing goal. That's sort of where we, where we are there. John, you got anything to add on that? No, thanks. No. Okay. Any anybody have any questions? So so rating day. Um, we're looking to schedule games at Sacred Heart. They will be on the grass field, so there'll be two games going on at the same time. Uh, one, game, one game will have probably varsity teams on it. One game will have JV teams on it. Doesn't matter which which field that you're going to be assigned to because you're going to get rated no matter what. Um, I would recommend getting there 30 minutes early, or if it's in the middle of the game or middle of the day, if you want to get there an hour early and just watch and just talk through things, that's fine. Uh, you're most likely are going to have 30 minutes, so you're going to get a half, which is going to be like 22, 23 minutes. Most likely, you'll have a break. We want you to observe and sort of decompress, ask questions that you have, and then you're going to get on the field again, either the next segment, the next 30-minute segment, so you'll have 30 minutes break, or it could be an hour later. I, I'm not going to have you there for an extended period of time where you're not officiating, but there, there will be a break in between. Um, so just be aware that you're, you're, you won't have two 30 minute halves back to back. We want people to sort of take a break, um, decompress, ask questions, <laughs> get ready for getting on the field again. All right, and let me see who asked a question there. Yeah, Ruby, uh, question, uh, field hockey cards, yeah, they're, they're the same color, they're fine, not an issue uh, at this point. So these are important dates for us. Um, again, the all umpires Zoom meeting on the 20th, rating day the 28th, which might change. Uh, Commonwealth League starts the 1st. Louisville is supposed to start the 6th, and Woodford County has a jamboree on uh, March 5th to the 7th. All right. Oh, oh there we are. Okay, well, thanks to John for, for really being the, the, the main force for putting it all together. Um, Let's see whatever the question here. Uh, it's nine o'clock meeting, correct, John? Are you muted again? Again, say again. Uh, the meeting <laughs> on the 20th is nine o'clock? Nine a.m., yes. Nine a.m. <laughs> Steve Rance told to get that information out. Okay. okay. Well, so some, some good questions, um, but we're here to answer all the questions that you have at this point. So if you've got any more questions, go ahead and ask. Um, you know, we're 7.55. We've tried to be respectful of everybody's time. We appreciate you coming out. John has sort of taken attendance, so he knows who's, who's here. And um, just for my benefit, I, I don't send a lot of emails out. So if I send an email out asking everyone to do something or, or giving you a date to say, hey, I'm going to assign games from March 15th to March 30th. So get your blocks in. Please get your blocks in. I'll, I'll, I'll work with everybody. Um, if I've assigned a game and you can't do it because you forgot to put your block in, I'll be, uh, I want to work with everyone. Just makes it easier for John and I if you, if we say, hey, look, we're going to assign these games, get your blocks in. Um, help, help us because things are changing all the time. It's really difficult 
games are getting canceled, season dates are changing. So just work with us. If we say we're going to sign March 15th to March 30th, please get your blocks in. Or likewise, April 1st to April 15th, get those blocks in. Um, I got a question. All um, right, Brian, go ahead. Um, my uh, new job hasn't uh, given me my uh, schedule yet for March. Okay. Um, I should be getting it real soon. As soon as I get it, I'll, I'll update my blocks for March. Yep. No, we appreciate that. I have a really quick question. It may be dumb. No, but no dumb you question. Block, no. <laughs> sorry, you block the days that you can do something. You block the days you can't. Oh, okay. Got it. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, it's fine. So, yeah, and, and just be aware, you can, it, it's a pretty, have you gotten in it all, Lauren? Uh, yeah, I've been kind of looking through it as we've gone along. Okay. Yeah, so what you want to do is you go into Arbiter, and it's got a section called Blocks. And so what you want to do is you want to go in there, and you can block a whole day. So like on a Saturday, say you're you're busy on a Saturday, and you've got something, family function, whatever, uh, you can block the whole day. Or you can go in there, and you can block partial days. So you can say, well, I'm done at 5 o'clock, and I'll be free at 6. So you go in there, and you block until 5. And then that way, if I have a 5.30 game, I, I probably can't assign you um or if i see that it's next to or, where are you a student lauren um i'm at uk but everything's online so i've just been home in louisville so okay. i'm pretty free okay so uh you know if you've got a, a, a meeting with your teacher on a particular day and you can't do it just let us know otherwise mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a really handy i don't know how they, they, they assigned before arbiter but it makes it sort of easier on us Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. So, so if you're at UK, just make sure that you have your Louisville address. Um, but if you're going to be in Lexington for any days, let John know because he assigns there. So if you're if you're going to be there for something, you know, send John an email. Say, hey, John, I'm going to be in Lexington on these days. I'll be available from these times, and he can maybe try to work work uh, some games in since you could be there already. All right. Anybody else have anything? Mr. Davis, you're kind of quiet. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. Been, I'm a teacher, so I've been Zooming a lot these days. Okay, good. Uh, any, any questions for us? Let us know. Um, I mean, John and I are here to really facilitate everybody being better officials, and we want to put you on games. We want to get you out there. Um, you know, unfortunately, we lost last season, um, which, you know, was a shame because we had a lot of newer officials and uh, we want to see people progress. Uh, the game is growing and there's opportunities to officiate in the summer to work on your game. Um, so take advantage of it. It's a great way to I have a daughter who's made a lot of money as a student. Um, we had uh, a high school student a couple of years ago made like over $2,000 uh, because she was available. She played, she was actually Miss Lacrosse. Um, and so, but she was available to officiate after practice and I put her on a ton of games. So her dad was really happy with the fact that his daughter, um, her hand wasn't out as much because she was making money playing lacrosse. So that worked out well. But uh, just reach out to us. John and I are here for you. We want to answer all the questions you have. Um, so just, just you know, use us. Um, another question for you. Yep. Um, this year, uh, this has been confusing from this year and last year. Um, do we need to pay this year and how much will it be this year? So U.S. lacrosse, you will have to pay. But club, you will not have to pay. So they've club has decided to forego dues for this year um, just to allow people, you know, that, that opportunity to, you know, it's, it's been a tough year for everybody. So from a financial perspective, club is foregoing their dues for this year, which is nice. So just be aware of that, but U S lacrosse, yeah, you have to pay. That's something we can't um, avoid.
Yeah, yeah, I, I, and I uh, thank you very much for clarifying that because I was a little confused. I, I paid for the U.S. Lacrosse. I, I yeah. just didn't know about. I didn't know about the club stuff. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Good. All right, John. Again, thanks. Um, everybody, be looking for an email on rating day in the next couple of days. So just be aware that one is coming out. And if there's a problem with the schedule, if you have on the 28th, a particular time, say you go to church and you wouldn't be able to get there until one or two, please let me know now because um, I will try to get that in the schedule. Uh, as of now, I haven't really had many requests, but just be aware that uh, it's going to go from probably 12 until six o'clock. As of now, it, that could change in the next day or two, depending on JCPS.